Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind, and we thank you for the revelation of it. We praise you for all that you accomplished through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Please be seated if you would. We're going to be continuing to share with you on the subject of God's covenant of prosperity today. We have brought forth several messages on this particular subject. We pointed out the fact that God's covenant of prosperity is in all aspects of life. It begins spiritually when we get born again. It continues as you receive His healing, His deliverance, and His work in your soul to heal you, to deliver you, to strengthen you, and to transform the, you by the renewing of your mind. Prosperity refers to having a good journey. We see in 3 John, verse 2, Beloved, I wish, above all things, which really means pray, this means to pray, concerning, this is the word peri, which means concerning all things, that you may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. God wants you to prosper. He wants you to have a good journey. This means to have a good journey, be successful in all the things that you do. God wants to bring his blessings upon you. As you get born again, you are a child of God, and he has all the promises that he wants to bring forth in your life. He wants to prosper you. It is in notice that it says that you will prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers, which means as your soul goes, so will your overall health and prosperity in life. Your soul is made up of your will, your intellect, and your emotions. You need to get your will set to do the Word of God, get your mind renewed to the words you know His ways, you govern your emotions, and you make the decision that you are going to follow the way of the Lord. God wants us to prosper. We pointed out the fact also, as we talked about many things, we talked about principles that were necessary for us to be prosperous in the Old Testament, also in the New Testament, covering many areas in about three different sessions. We also talked about tithing and answering objections to tithe. That was last Sunday and Sunday evening. Also, we pointed out the fact that the tithing now is in the New Testament. Many people have thought that it was just for the Old Testament, but we also pointed out that it was prior to the Old Testament. It was here in the very beginning with Abel, who was to bring the firstlings, which is the tithe, the first fruits of, what, of, his, of his herds, of his flocks. And so the tithe was from the very beginning. It continued on with Abraham paying tithes, with Jacob paying tithes as well, bringing the tenth unto the Lord, and also continuing through the Old Testament era and the New Testament era. And we did point out one scripture we'll show you regarding the tithe. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8, makes it very clear that tithing is for the New Testament era. Here, men that die receive tithes. That's people here on earth. There he receiveth them of whom it's witness that he liveth. There is in heaven, because the one who is witness that he liveth, who has been raised from the dead, is Jesus. Where is he? He is in heaven, at the right hand of the Father. So, the tithes as they are brought, they are not just received by men here on earth, they're also received by the Lord Jesus, who takes it and sets it before the Father to worship him in order to see the blessings of God be released and come to pass in our life. And we've talked about the great blessings that he wants to bring forth in our life. Well, today we're going to look at it from a different aspect, and we're going to talk about hindrances to prosperity. God wants us to prosper in everything that we do, and we must eliminate hindrances to it. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, first of all, we see what God purposes. Verse 1, It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. As you do the word of God, and you fulfill the responsibilities of the covenant relationship that you have, Obeying, hearkening diligently, God will bring his blessings upon us, it says. All the blessings will come. And in the midst of these blessings that he's talking about, we come down here to verse 8, and he says, The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. 
God wants to bless all of the works of your hands. He'll bless you in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, which is a type of the spiritual land, which is you and I have come into. Now the, the spiritual land, which is coming into Christ, we're born from above, we have relationship with Him, and all the promises belong to us. He wants to bless us and bring forth the promises of God in our life. We also see in verse 11 and following, the Lord will make you plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy ground, and the land which the Lord sware unto the fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, to bless all the work of thine hand. God wants to bless all the work of your hand. That means we can see everything be blessed if we do what God says. Thou shalt lend unto many nations, thou shalt not borrow. He wants to bring such prosperity into you that you will not have to borrow. Instead, you will be lending to others. Verse 13, The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, thou shalt not be beneath, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. It does come down to us being a doer of the commandments. We are under the New Testament commandments now, and we are to be obedient to them. Now what happens if you don't obey them? Verse 15, it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. The curses will come upon you and overtake you if you do not obey. Disobedience brings curses. It will hinder your prosperity in life. God wants us to prosper. And we see many of these curses listed. Here we see some. He says in verse 20, The Lord shall send upon thee cursing and vexation and rebuke and all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do. Otherwise, instead of being blessed, your well you do will not be blessed. You will see cursing. You will see all kinds of destruction come until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly. Because of the wickedness of thy doing, where thou hast forsaken me, because we are not walking in his ways. Verse 29, Thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. This is because of disobedience. Many people think of just if I do certain things financially, that means I'll automatically prosper. No, it's the whole package. If you disobey God, it will hinder your overall prosperity in life. It says you'll only be oppressed, spoiled evermore. No man shall save thee. God wants us to be obedient. That is a key to you seeing the blessings come forth. You can even be a tither and a giver of offerings where you're obedient in some ways, but if you're disobedient in other ways, that's going to hinder your prosperity. Deuteronomy 28, verse 38. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, the things you sow, but shall gather but little in. That means you won't be reaping the blessings from what you sow. God wants us to. What we sow, we're to reap and we're to see blessings. He'll multiply the seed sown. It says the locust shall consume it. Now why is that? That's because of disobedience in life. We must put the word first place and do what he says. Here's another part of the curses. He shall lend to thee and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head and thou shalt be the tail. Well, that's the opposite of what it said and when we talk about the blessings, you don't want to be the tail, you want to be the head. You don't want to be under bondage, you want to be the one who has the prosperity. That's what God will bring forth if you obey. If you don't, then you will be under bondage. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed. Because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. God wants us to be blessed. We also see your attitude is important. Verse 47, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness, you must have a joyfulness in serving the Lord, and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore you'll serve your enemies. The Lord shall send against thee in hunger and thirst and nakedness and want of all things, and put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until they've destroyed thee. By the way, all these places where it talks about the Lord sending such and such, these are all in a permissive sense in the Hebrew, indicating not that he causes them, 
but he permits these things to come upon you because of his word, because he is a righteous God. And who's the one who's bringing the destruction? The devil. Why? Because of the open door of sin. Remember, it's the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus wants to bring life. He wants to bring blessing. He wants to bring great things upon you in your life. So all of these where it speaks of the Lord doing this, it's in a permissive sense. He permits these things to come because he's not going to compromise his word for anybody. When you obey, you will see blessings. When you disobey, curses will come upon you. A second reason for hindrance of the prosperity, of course, will be if you are not a tither. We saw this and we talked about this in Malachi chapter 3, but we'll look at a couple verses. Verse 8, he says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? They didn't even know. He gave them the answer. In tithes, the tithes is the tenth, this means the tenth part, the tenth of the gross income that comes into your hands, and also of offerings. You're cursed with a curse. What happens if you're not a tither and a giver of offerings? Curses will come upon you. You are cursed with a curse. For not only did you rob God, but you robbed the whole nation, which would today would be the church, the holy nation, where the funds are brought in for the propagation of the gospel to be sent forth. Verse 10, then he tells us what to do. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith. This is something where you're going to prove God by your obedience to the word, because he's a performer of his word, remember. Herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. The blessings of God will come upon you in all types in your life. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. God wants you to be a tither. Also, one other thing we might point out, if you're not a tither, one of the reasons is that you're going to see curses is the fact that, will God even receive what you bring? No. Here we see in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. An offering. He didn't bring the tithe. He just brought whatever he wanted to bring. Abel, he also brought of the firstlings. And we pointed out that this is the birthright offering. And we showed many scriptures showing how the birthright offering was the, was the tithe. That was the tithe. We brought that forth last week. This is the tithe of his flock and the fat thereof, which was the best, the choicest part. Otherwise, he brought the first unto God. And God had respect unto Abel and to his offering. He received it. To Cain in his offering, he did not respect. So he didn't receive his offering because it was not right. By the way, it's important revelation that you see here when you look at this in the Hebrew. When it says in the process of time, not a good translation. The word here, kates in the Hebrew, means at the end of. At the end of, if you notice down here. Of time, and when it says it came to pass here, it's speaking here of the end of days, the end of days that have come. This is a talk, here's about the days, this word also here referring to. So Young's brings it out correctly. It comes to pass at the end of days. What's that talking about? That's talking about the end of the days, uh, which would be of the 6,000 man, years of man's uh, being here on earth to be carrying out uh, the, the rule and reign over the earth, which is what they were supposed to do. So this is talking about end time thing. It's pointing towards a prophetic end time situation, which is that there'll be those who are of the spirit of Cain who will just give whatever they want to give. But with those who have the spirit of Abel, who are tithers, who are going to bring the birthright offering, and they are going to see the blessings come upon them. We see it happening in the church today. There are those churches even, even denominations or groups of churches that do not believe in tithing. They have failed to understand. They thought it was under the Old Testament only, which is a lie. It was prior to that, as we pointed out, and also continued in the New Testament. And so we see this actually coming to pass where a smaller number of Christians are tithing in this day, and they are making a great mistake. Curses will surely come upon them. 
Another thing is, remember it talks about tithes and offerings as well. When you give of offerings, which is above the tithe, that'd be over the 10%, you're going to be sowing things and then God is going to be multiplying that or causing you to reap the things that you've sowed. Look what it says about Isaac in Genesis 26, 12. Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. God gave him a hundred times because of his sowing. It means that as you come into the place now as sowing for the gospel's sake, giving of offerings above that, that has the hundredfold return involved in it. We see this also even referred to when you meet the conditions, that is, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my sake, and the Gospels. This is referring to the fact that they put the Gospel first place before everything else. That's what you need to do. If that's the case, he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands, persecutions, and in the age to come, this means eternal life. This is because they put the Lord first place, and they are going to be blessed. They're going to see the hundredfold return in their own life. But there will also be persecutions as this is coming forth in their life. Giving of offerings is important because not only do we tithe, but we also give of the abundance as God has blessed us to minister to the poor, minister to other people in need, and these are offerings above the tithe. Second Corinthians 9, 6, which is talking about giving of offerings in this, these chapters. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. See, whatever you're sowing is what you're going to reap. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, not because I ought to, or of necessity, or really grudgingly would be because I have to, think I have to do it, be grudgingly, or of necessity because I have to, or essentially. God loves a cheerful or joyous giver. This means that you have, must give with the right heart attitude. You cannot give grudgingly or because I ought to or because I should. That's not the way you approach things. God wants you to have a heart that's joyous, excited to give the things that God wants. God loves a joyous giver, as he says. And then what? God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you have all sufficiency in all things and may abound to every good work. This isn't a promise that you can just take hold of unless you met the conditions. The reason this is so is because when it talks about this abounding, this is a subjunctive mood verb that you may abound. Good way they translated it correctly there in the King James, showing the conditional statement. A subjunctive mood verb is a conditional statement where conditions have to be met before you see the results. It's also present tense indicating the fact that it will be ongoing, abounding. Otherwise, as you give, God will bring continually to you for be able to give out to others, abounding to every good work, if you meet the conditions and you'll have all sufficiency as well in your life. But you've got to do it with the right attitude. You must be a tither, of course, and a giver of offerings joyfully, never grudgingly, never of necessity. So we have to have a right attitude. That will affect you in your prosperity. He's dispersed abroad, scattered abroad. He's given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever, it says. He that ministers seed to the sower and both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. That's what God will do for you if you meet the conditions. And in fact, this is God's desire because as he ministers seed to you, he wants you to then give of offerings as you are able, as God is directing you to minister to others. And when he talks about ministering bread for your food, this is something that he desires. It's interesting that this is an optative mood. 
There's five different moods in the Greek, and the optative mood expresses a wish or a desire. Otherwise, this is not a command. This is just a, simply a desire. He's ministering this bread for your food, and also in the multiplying of your seed sown, the same thing. These are all optative mood verbs. Through In the increasing of the fruits of your righteousness, this is all what God desires. Of course, conditions have to be met. It's what His will is for you if you will do the things that He wants you to do. Otherwise, you can't claim these promises that He's multiplying your seed sown and increasing the fruits of your righteousness if you haven't met the conditions. It is His desire, but it is a conditional statement. Another thing, Giving to the poor. God does tell us that we are to give to the poor. Proverbs 28, verse 27. He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. As God brings abundance to you, he wants you to do not just be a tither for the gospel to go forth in the church, but he wants you to be a giver of offerings if he has blessed you Otherwise, you just don't heap it up and store it up for you all, everything for yourself. No, you'd be available to give out to others. If you hide your eyes, oh, I'm not going to look at anything. You know, I'm not even going to think about wanting to give to anybody. You're going to have many a curse because you have been called to carry out a ministry of giving unto others, to minister to the poor, and to help other people. We see Psalms 41. That tells us we have many a curse. But here's the blessing that will come. Psalms 41.1 Blessed is he that considers the poor. And here's the blessing that follows. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. If you are used to help deliver someone who's poor, in any aspect this is, not just financially, in any aspect. They might be poor spiritually. They might be poor in, in some aspect. You're coming to give to them. You give out to help deliver them, then what does God do? How a covenant works? He gives, it comes back to you. He'll come to deliver you in your time of trouble and to set you free. So this is another important thing. If not, you're going to hinder your prosperity in life. Another thing that's important, of course, is you will not prosper if you don't deal with your sins. You can be a tither. You can be a giver of offerings. You can be given to the poor and all these things. But if you don't deal with your sins, it's going to stop your prosperity in life. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins, he just kind of sweeps them under the rug, shall not prosper. But whoso confesses and forsakes them, he leaves them behind, he turns away from them, shall have mercy, the mercy of God. That's the love of God in action to minister unto you, to meet needs and to minister in all kinds of aspect of your life. So don't cover your sins, deal with them. Confess your sins, conf repent from them, Turn away from them, and that is so important. Another thing that's important is, in this life, you've been born from above. You are not of this world. You are of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. You now are in this world, but not of this world. So therefore, you are to live according to heaven's ways. And as you do the things of the word of God, you are actually laying up store laying up treasures in heaven where you are from when you're walking in line with the word. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Anything on the earth can be stolen. See, treasures refers to those things that you have collected and laid up that are precious, that are important to you. Do not be seeking after all these worldly things all these things on the earth. No. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. Otherwise, are you doing things to get treasures here on the earth? Or are you doing things to pile up treasures in heaven because you're doing the word of God, being obedient, carrying out the will of God for all the things he wants you to do? That is how you're going to lay up treasures in heaven when you're doing the will of God. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That also shows whether your heart's for the Lord, to walk in His ways and do all the things He wants you to do and be a servant of Him, 
or whether you're serving yourself and you're all out for everything you can get here in this world. Wherever your treasure is, wherever your focus is, all the things that you're collecting, all the things that are important to you that you're trying to attain to. Many people try to attain to all these worldly things and position and power and, and accomplishments and all these kind of things. You should be wanting to obtain, attain to everything that God has for you. Remember, Paul said he's running for that, uh, uh, running after that high mark of the calling of God in Christ Jesus to get the real prize. God wants you to be seeking after the things of God. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. That's how God can tell whether you have a heart that's for God or not. Another thing, you must know that God is your source who will meet all of your needs. You don't look into man, you don't look into yourself. You look into God to bless and prosper the work of your hands and that God will cause the increase to come to you in your life. Philippians 4.19 my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God is your source who gives you the power to get wealth, who enables you to prosper, and he will bless the work of your hands so that you will see the blessings come forth. So who's your source? You've got to have God focused as your source. If you will look to God, then he will meet every need. We see that that was the mark about Abram. Remember Abram, Abraham at this point, he was to take Isaac up and offer up his son, and he obeyed, ready with a knife up, ready to kill his son. And God said, now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld your son, your only son. And in doing so, of course, he provided him the lamb and the thicket, which is providing, uh, all pointing towards Jesus, who is going to accomplish the great uh, redemption and pay the price. But it's interesting here that after he had offered up this burnt offering in the stead of his son, verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. The point is that Abraham, he trusted God that God would raise his son from the dead because he had already had a promise that about what his seed, what was going to happen to his seed, that he would bless him and multiply him and all the things that would happen. He'd be the father of many nations. He had all these promises already. So he counted that if he killed him, he'd raise him from the dead. He trusted God to perform his word. Otherwise, he looked to God as his source. He believed that God was the one who would accomplish his work regardless of what he did. Even if he killed his own son in obedience to God, and so Jehovah Jireh is a word which literally means the Lord who sees ahead. The Lord who sees or the Lord who sees ahead to meet the needs. If you will trust in the Lord, God will see ahead to meet your needs. If you will trust in him though. He trusted in him. You need to trust in him and obey his word regardless of what the situation is. If you will trust in the Lord, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide as he sees ahead to meet the need. And he will do that for you in your life. Proverbs chapter 13. Not only is disobedience going to hinder our prosperity, but also if we will not listen to his instructions and his correction in our life. Proverbs 13, 18. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. This means the discipline, chastening, and correction of the Lord. When God is bringing his word to you, this is the word of God. We need to take heed to it. We need to be a doer of it. We need to pay attention to it and hearken to it. If we do not do it and do not receive his correction when he's coming to correct us or to discipline us, then we're going to have poverty and shame. But he that regards the reproof, the correction that he brings, shall be honored. And when God honors you, he's going to bring riches and blessing upon you in your life. God wants us to make sure that we are receiving his instruction, receiving his correction, receiving any discipline that he might bring, so that we get ourselves right with the Lord. It will affect your prosperity. Second Chronicles 26, verse 5. 
He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Which means, if you stop seeking the Lord, you will not prosper. You seek the Lord by seeking His Word, by doing what His Word says, by praying, listening to the Holy Spirit, getting His leading, guiding your life, doing the Word and watching God work in your life as He brings, leads you step by step, showing you what to do. As you seek the Lord, God will cause you to prosper. If you don't seek the Lord, you will not prosper. And what are we to be seeking? Of course, what's the first thing he tells us that we're to be seeking? In Matthew chapter 6, and verse 33, he says, Seek ye first, means first in time and place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's the rule and the reign of God. And his righteousness, because you've got to walk in his righteous ways. The righteousness is the ways of righteousness, word of righteousness. And then all these things, which would be all of your needs, will be met, they'll be added unto you in your life. You've got to be seeking the right things. You can't be seeking what you want. You need to be seeking the kingdom. You need to be seeking his righteousness. Is what you're doing is in line with righteousness? If not, if you're out there just doing your own thing, are you going to be blessed? No. You're not going to see God's prosperity come forth in your life. In Psalms 34, Psalms 34, verse 10. Young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want, or this means lack or be without, any good thing. Again, seeking the Lord is a key. You need to seek the Lord in everything. Put Him first place. You don't seek the Lord when I just have a problem. I need to get, get me out of this problem. You need to seek the Lord about everything in your life. You seek Him for Him leading you, guiding you, prospering you, blessing you, showing you step by step, showing you the things He wants you to do in all aspects of life. Then you will not lack for any good thing. We also need to hearken to His voice, as we already saw Scripture, about if we disobey. Here we see in Isaiah 48, where they wouldn't listen to him. And God is speaking here, lamenting, saying, Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. If you and I will do the New Testament commandments, that's tied into your blessings. You'll have peace. Your peace had been as a river. A river is something just flowing continually. And thy righteousness is the waves of the sea. They keep coming and coming and coming and coming. The waves of the sea don't stop, do they? That's what God wants. And when he speaks of peace, this remembers the word shalom, where we talked about in Psalms 35, 27, where he has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. The word prosperity there is the same word shalom, meaning the overall prosperity in all aspects of life, because the word shalom refers to a completeness, soundness, welfare, peace, health, prosperity, safety, quiet, all these things. God wants you to be prosperous, to be blessed in everything that you do but it's tied into obeying the commandments. If we don't hearken to the commandments of the Lord, we're not going to be blessed. It's going to hinder your prosperity. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And well, that's prosperity. That means there has to be a willingness. You can't just do things grudgingly. You can't do things because I have to or ought to. You've got to have your heart in it and your willingness. I choose to do it. I want to do it. It's like we saw about the way you give. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured with a sword. For the mouth of the Lord shall have spoken it. God expects us to be willing and obedient. Willing obedience is ex extremely important. Another thing is if you have any greed or covetousness, you are not going to prosper. Luke 12, verse 15. He said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Covetousness means a greedy desire to have more. Now God wants to prosper you as you carry out the work of your hands and the things that he wants you to do. 
so he will prosper the work of your hands. But we're talking about a greedy desire to have more, where you're focused instead of doing what God wants you to do and watching God prosper the work of your hands and bringing his blessings, you're all, your whole focus is on money, 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 or things, 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 things. A greedy desire to have more. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. No. It consists in whether you're walking in the ways of the Word of God or not. Ephesians, that is. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Fornication, all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint's. He doesn't want to have these things in your life at all. Any greed, any covetousness. Don't get your eyes on money. Don't get your eyes on things. Get your eyes on the Lord. You get your eyes on doing what He says. He will bless you. He will prosper you. He will bring things forth. It all comes down to an attitude of heart. Verse 5, you know, This you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who's an idolater, those that have their focus on money, are actually an idolatry. They're looking to that as a source. God will bring money to you and finances to you because you're serving Him and looking to Him and He's blessing you instead of you just seeking after all these riches and these things. He's not going to have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. That's the millennial reign of Jesus and of God, which refers to the future kingdom forever because the kingdom is going to be turned back into the hands of the Father after Jesus has finished the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So this means, essentially, you have no inheritance forever. You see, the inheritance comes from God. So you do what God says, and He'll bless the work of your hands. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, again, which is idolatry. It is idolatrous. You can't serve God and mammon, it says, which refers to riches or money at the same time. No way. Another thing. Acts chapter 8, verse 20. Peter said, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. If you think that you're going to give money to get God to bring a healing to you or to prosper you, or to bless you, or give you some answer to prayer and all these things, you're mistaken, sadly. You do not purchase the gifts of God with money. The gifts of God are free. They've already been given to you. Your money is brought as it belongs to God, your tithe, and you are being a vessel for God to use you to be a blessing to others, and he will multiply that back, or you give to the poor, he'll give it back to you as you only lend to the Lord. But you're not going to be purchasing gifts from God. You're not going to be purchasing promises. Anybody that's ever tries to get you to give money for such and such, you know, all these guys on the radio and TV that say, well, if you'll give such and such, then I'll do this. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. That's not a gift. That's a transaction. And they try to tell you it's a, it's a gift. It's a lie. Don't ever do that. Never allow yourself to be, fall into that. It's ridiculous. So they try to give you these, these tremendous promises, you know. Do you such and such. I've heard them say, you know, sell your thousand dollars and God's going to give you a brand new house. <laughs> <laughs> Paid for, you know. <laughs> uh, ridiculous. This is all false teaching. Any of these things will hinder your prosperity. You can't have any idolatry before the Lord. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. More literally, Young's brings out what this means. For a root of all the evils is the love of money, because root, here there's no definite article before it. It literally means a root of all the evils is the love of money. It'll be a root of all these different evils. It'll lead you in wrong ways. And which certain longing for, that shows a covetous, greedy attitude. Longing for. You should want to be possessing the promises and for God to bless you to do things. Remember, Abraham, 
You know, when the, he's, he didn't take the money from those kings and all the spoils from those kings. He didn't want them. He said, God's the one who's going to make me rich. God's going to give me those things. He wasn't just going to take them because he could get it from somebody else. Now, you don't want to be coveting after or longing for these things. It's a mistake. We see many in the body of Christ that are making the great mistake by getting their eyes on riches and money. This will hinder your prosperity. Also, trusting in uncertain riches. You can't be trusting in money. You trust in God. Proverbs eleven twenty eight: He that trusteth in his riches shall fall. It's going to happen. But the righteous shall flourish as a branch because he's trusting in the Lord. And God will bless him. Over in Psalms 62. Psalm 62. Verse 10. Trust not in oppression, become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, if you do have finances or things increase, set not your heart upon. There's nothing wrong with having money. God wants us to have abundance and blessing. Just make sure that you just don't set your heart on them. Your heart's on the Lord. And you just do with the money what God wants you to do. He does give us richly all things to enjoy and to bless us. He also wants you to be a vessel to ready to give out or whatever he wants you to do with the finances that comes in. Set not your heart upon them. Don't get your heart on money. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. In Mark <coughs> chapter 10, Jesus made a statement that it caused the disciples to be astonished. He said in verse 23, Jesus looked round about and said to his disciples, how hardly or how difficult, this means with difficulty, how with difficulty have they that have riches to enter in the kingdom of God? See, the problem is they have a tendency to look to that as a source. Remember the Laodicean church? Oh, I got my money. I got all my possessions. You know, I really don't need God. I got all the things I want. That's their attitude. They let it become a source. Disciples were astonished at his words. Jesus answering again and said to him, Children, how hard is it for them how difficult is it, for hard, hard for them, the trust in riches to enter in the kingdom of God. Again, riches is not a problem. It's whether you trust in them. Unfortunately, many people, when they get riches, they start to trust in them. They get the finances, you know, and then they start trusting them, and they don't start seeking the Lord and following the Lord and doing the things that God wants and depending upon Him, which is a great mistake. First Timothy <coughs> Chapter 6, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, which means age. It's the word aeon. We are rich in this age, that they be not high-minded. Don't think that you're something great and you've really arrived and proud to look at me because I got all these things. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. You must trust in the Lord who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Remember, who's the one that gives you the power to get wealth? It's the Lord. Remember this scripture that we've looked at, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. This is part of his covenant promises to bring wealth to you. It's okay, as long as your eyes are on him which he swear unto the fathers as it is this day. So he wants to bring wealth and blessing to you. Same time, remember, you cannot be serving riches. If you are serving riches, you're an idolatry. And you're, gonna, you're not going to enter into the kingdom. It's that severe. Proverbs 28, 50. 28, 20, excuse me. Proverbs 28, 20. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich, he's driven, driven to get money, 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 shall not be innocent. That's a mistake. He that hasteth to be rich has an evil eye. That's what God says. He considers not that poverty shall come upon him. It's an attitude of heart. 
You do your work unto the Lord, and God will lead you and guide you in all the things you do, and he will bless the work of your hands, and as you're following his direction, he will bring blessings to you. He wants you, even investments-wise, if you're wise in investments that he wants you to do, not trying to, you know, gam gambling that so many people are involved in, in all kinds of aspects, it'll bring tremendous curses because all they're out to do is try to get money, 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 money. Now, you got to let God prosper you. Look at verse 6. Better is the poor that walks in his uprightness than he that's perverseness in his ways, though he be rich. The problem is people many times have become rich. They, they get their eyes on money. They begin to fall away from the Lord. They're not as zealous for the Lord. Are you praying like you once prayed? Are you in the Word, studying the Word? No, I'm out there rich, seeking for my riches, you know, <laughs> looking to get all I can and then to do all the things that I want to do. Now, you can't serve riches. You are going to see curses coming upon you. You also can't be lazy. If you're lazy, that'll hinder your prosperity. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, and consider her ways and be wise. Having no guide, overseer, or ruler. We have a guide. We have the Holy Spirit. We got Jesus, uh, head of the church, you know, ruling and overseeing. Provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Get a little sleep, a little slumber, a little fold of the hands to sleep. Social life, poverty comes one that traveleth. And I want your lack or poverty as an armed man. It'll come and just capture you. It'll come and just take you like, a, like an armed man coming to, to hold you up. It'll come on you just like that. We've seen so many that have lost much because they allowed themselves to be lazy, slothful, not do what they should have done. Proverbs 20, verse 13. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Laziness. God doesn't bless laziness. He blesses diligence. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Proverbs 24. We cannot be lazy. We cannot be slothful. Proverbs 24, verse 30. I went by the field of slothful, uh, the lazy guy. By the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Lo, it was all grown over with thorns. And nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall there was broken down. Everything got broken down. I saw and considered it well, and I looked upon it and received instruction. A little sleep, little slumber, little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travel, <coughs> and thy want as an armed man. It came upon him because they were lazy and slothful. God is going to prosper the work of your hands. He wants you to be diligent, not lazy. There's no room for laziness. God does not bless laziness. Proverbs 23, 21. The drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness which shall clothe a man with rags. We cannot be lazy, we cannot be slothful, we cannot be a drunkard, we cannot be gluttonous, we can't be allowing these things to come upon us. If they're running you, then you will come to poverty. It'll take you down. You know, you can't have those things. Remember the guy was a glutton and a, and a drunkard they stoned him in the Old Testament. You know, my son, he won't listen to me. He was continually in those evil ways. It'll bring curses upon you, see. Poverty will come upon you. It will, you won't get away with it. All these curses will come upon you. Another thing that brings a lot of hindrances to prosperity, and we'll be talking about more about this tonight, are inherited generational iniquity curses where evil spirits have come into you from the inheritance from three and four generations back that will also be, affect you in all areas of your life, including those that affect you, hindering your prosperity. Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is long-suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. That means if you have poverty in your inheritance line, three and four generations back. You got drunkards, you got gluttons, you got stealers, you got liars, you got slothful ones, you got the, you know, whatever, all these different things that we see. You got people that weren't tithers. 
You got people that were disobedient, on and on. Heritage generational iniquity curses can come down the line from three and four generations. Those demons will come in you at the time of conception and they will hinder your prosperity. That's why you want to be involved in deliverance, to cast out all of the spirits. There could be witchcraft curses. If you have American Indian blood, you can have Indian curses which brought tremendous poverty upon them because they served demons and all the things that they did. Poverty, loss of prosperity, all types of curses can come upon you. It can be upon curses on the steps of your feet, on the work of your hands, even though God wants to bless them. This is all from inherited generational iniquity curses from spirits that come down the line. Look at your inheritance line. Yeah, my grandfather, he, he lost everything, and father, he lost everything, all these destructive things. Look at all my family, everybody seemed like they're in poverty, and they've seen all these destructive things, and it seemed like there's all these hindrances. So what does that tell you? Inherited generational iniquity effects are causing problems. They can be hindering your prosperity. You need to cast out those spirits. They will draw destructive things. They will hinder. You need to drive them out. Anything from inheritance has to be cast out. Another thing that we see. Those ones who are following after wrong people or wrong things in order to try to get money, 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 you know, they are going to be in trouble. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. God's going to prosper the work of your hands. He that followeth after vain, anything that's vain, worthless, empty. Persons has been added there, if you notice. You can tell it's, it's not, it's, a, it's a, italicized there. It's differently. Shall have poverty, enough. So if you follow after things that are worthless, things that are not of the Lord, you are going to have poverty. It is going to come upon you. You're not going to get away from it. Another thing we see, people that follow pleasures. Proverbs 21, verse 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. This is talking about not alcohol. This is talking about the prosperity of their wine crop and of their oil. Otherwise, they were loving to get all their prosperity. Their eyes were on their prosperity instead of on the Lord. They shall not be rich. We can't be loving pleasure. We can't have our eyes on all of these things. Those people that are seeking after pleasures in the world, of course, is just shouting at you continually. Come here, come here. This will please you. I'll please you over here. Please you with this. Please you with that. Look what it says in 1 Timothy 5, 6. She that liveth in pleasure luxuriously is dead while she lives. She's not living on the Lord. She's living unto herself just to get all types of pleasures and doing all these things. That's a big mistake. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. When it's listing out all these ones here that are, it talks about in the last days, the perilous times will come, listing all these ones, men are lovers themselves, and so forth. And here it says the traitors, headies, the high miners, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They're more interested in pleasure than God. You know, a lot of people, even the pros false prosperity teaching, the ultra prosperity teaching that goes forth in many circles today, it's all about getting so much, you know. Make me a millionaire, make me a billionaire, get me a house, six houses, a yacht, and all these different things. It's all about accumulation of things. It's terrible. But this is going on in the body of Christ. God wants to bless you. But lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God? What are we doing with our life? Uh, we're not serving the Lord. We'll be looking to see what, what, all we can get. Titus 3.3 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. That tells you what it is. If you're after these things, God says you're foolish. He says you're disobedient. And He says you've been deceived by the devil. Doing what? Serving divers lusts and pleasures. We can't be serving them. You're actually serving them when you are seeking after them and living in them. No, oh, we can't have that whatsoever. These are all going to be tremendous hindrances to your prosperity. In fact, you won't even be right with God. James chapter 5, verse 5. He said, you've lived in pleasure on the earth. That's all they cared about, living luxuriously. And have been wanton. 
You've nourished your hearts in the day of slaughter. All they cared about was what they could get. It didn't serve the Lord. No, you need to make the Lord first place. You make him Lord over every aspect of your life, including all of your finances. Proverbs chapter 22 also. What else is going to hinder your prosperity? Verse 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrow is, borrow is servant to the lender. You only own what you own clear. You don't own if you have loans. Having a loan is not sin. But you want to seek to be able to pay off all of your debts and get to the place where you own clear. The borrower is servant to the lender. You don't own anything until you have nobody else on there except for just your name. So God doesn't want us to be burdened down. Many people have allowed themselves to get burdened down with so much debt. He wants you to work towards getting out of debt. Start buying things as you can afford them. Don't be in debt for everything because I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Certainly you're going to have, unless you have a lot of finances that have been blessed with, you're going to be using uh, the for loans for like larger purchases such, as, purchases such as a car or such as a home or something. But many times some people say, well, I want the, the $50,000 car when maybe a $20,000 car would be a better one or $25,000 or maybe even a used car for $5,000 or something like that until you get to the place where you can buy the other one. You know, and then you get yourself in a mess and then you end up losing everything later on. And plus you're paying out all this interest just going out the door you know, to the lender. You're serving the lender. Having debt is not a sin. You want to strive to get out of debt. Do everything possible. And tonight we'll be talking about having a budget. We'll be talking about knowing where your money is going. We're going to be talking about a lot of things that are important practically because you need to ha have all, you need to know where all your money's going. And you need to make sure you've got your priorities in order and you're doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. You know, the more you can pay for everything in cash, that's best. Use credit cards, make sure you can pay them off. Don't be heaping up credit. You're just getting yourself in more bondage in your life. Do not follow the way, the American way, the people and the worldly way of teaching you. They want you to get, here, here's six credit cards, you know, and just little, max them out, you know. <laughs> That's not the way to go. He doesn't want you to do that stuff. He wants you to prosper, let God prosper the work of your hands and buy the things as you go. We'd be smarter. Your object will be to get debt-free of everything and what you do. That's where you want to be focused and it's where you want to be headed towards. Your confidence needs to be absolutely in the Lord on everything. Another thing, co-signing. Co-signing is not a good thing. When you're co-signing, if you are co-signed for some, you gotta realize you're gonna be paying that off possibly because they may not make the payment like co-signing for a child or co-signing for someone. Proverbs 22, verse 26. Be not one of them that strike hands, talking about you made an agreement, or of them that are sureties, you made a pledge for a debt that's co-signing. It tells you not to do this. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? You know, if the person can't pay or something, and then you can't pay, you lose what you have. He takes away your house, your bed, and you're sleeping on the street. That's what it's talking about. The scriptures talk about this. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 15. He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth sur sur suretyship is sure. Otherwise, this is again, being one who is, is making a, like a uh, co-signing in some way for someone, especially you don't do it for a stranger. You wanna make sure you're only, if you're gonna do something, you want to make sure that you're doing it for someone that you would know, but the, here, here's the attitude you have to have. If you're going to do something, it would be smarter instead of getting your name on what they are doing and then tying you into what they do, it'd be better for you to take out a loan and then give them the money and then you pay the loan off yourself mm -hmm. instead of co-signing on something for them. Otherwise, you make the loan and then 
they, 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 so otherwise you're going to be hung and tied in with them because you better figure that you're going to maybe have to pay that off. A man void of understanding striketh hands. He says he's not wise, see. And becomes surety in the presence of his friend. I tell you, this a lot of times can break friendships, you know. You're trying to help out a friend and then they don't pay you back, you know. I know a particular case where someone's just trying to help out one of their family members, you know, and help to co-sign on for them to get an apartment because they didn't have any, hardly any money and so forth and all, and the per person committed that they were going to be there. And after a month or so, they decided, well, I don't want to live anymore. I'm going I'm to go to Florida. And they left and left the person high and dry, and they had to pay all that rent for the rest of that term, that year, because they left them. Those kind of things will happen if you co-sign. If you co-sign, if you do it, you be prepared. You better be ready to pay that off and know that you're going to have to pay for it. It's better for you to take a loan instead. Otherwise, you can have all kinds of destructive effects come upon you. Also, you've got to watch family members, too. You want to help them out, but uh, are they really going to be trustworthy? It's better for you just to do things on your own. Because a lot of times they're not trustworthy. Jeremiah 2, 37. Ye thou shalt go forth from him and thine hands upon that head, for the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not <coughs> prosper in them. If you have your own confidences, it's not going to work. Your confidence has to be in the Lord. God's got to be your total confidence. You won't prosper in your own confidences of trying to figure out, you know, doing it your own way. He says, O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? No. Wherefore say my people, we are lords. We're running our own life. We will come no more unto thee. Ah, we don't need you anymore. <laughs> Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride or attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. That's what a lot of people will do especially when they get some finances or something. Mm -hmm. Your trust must be in the Lord. Proverbs 3, verse 26. The Lord shall be thy confidence. Don't put your confidence in anything else. And shall keep thy foot from being taken or captured. You let the Lord be your total confidence. You know, you trust in all kinds of things. You trust in this world system or trust in a person or trust in this person and that. And how many, how many stories have we heard of people that got taken by this and scammed by this and all kinds of stuff. You want to be wise. And if you don't have the leading of the Lord on anything, you better not be getting involved in it. And you don't want to be involved in anything that's going to lead you down a path of destruction. You've got to stay away from all these evil kind of things especially so many people get involved in gambling type things. Gambling is covetousness. It is greediness, and we should have nothing to do with it. Anything where you're trying to, it's the same thing basically playing the stock market with the penny stocks and all those things is gambling, essentially. You know, Playing the football pools or the, the bingo games or any of the stuff that they, oh, they have a nice little uh, thing, you know, raffle at, at uh, uh, the work and all that stuff. Stay away from it. It's all gambling. You're looking for you to get the lucky number or whatever all, which is all the devil, in order for him prosper you. No. You don't want any of that stuff. You stay away from it all, it will bring absolute curses upon you in your life. And it's amazing. We even have pastors out there that aren't doing the things that they should do. Look what it says about Jeremiah 10, 21. For the pastors have become brutish. The word brutish happens to be in a nephal stem here. This is the nephal stem, and it means stupid and dull-hearted. <laughs> stupid pastors, dull-hearted pastors. Uh, they aren't doing the right thing. What was the problem? They didn't seek the Lord. Oh, they must be in it for a business. They must be in it for, you know, money, money, money or something. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. No, we're going to be serving the Lord and putting Him first place 
They must seek the Lord and do the things that He wants someone to do. We certainly can't be disobeying in any way. If you transgress the commandments of the Lord, you're not going to prosper. Putting God's Word first place is absolutely essential. Here in 2 Chronicles 24, 20, the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, and he said to him, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that you cannot prosper? Because you've forsaken the Lord, he's also forsaken you. Are we going to prosper if we're not obeying his commandments and doing the things? No. Also, you can't have any fears. Your trust is in the Lord, not in what's going to happen in the world. You know, whether the world's going to go down, the economies go down, you know, this or that. This or that's going to fail. No, you trust in the Lord. Job 3.25, The thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. That's what happened with Job. Fear drew all of his problems. We can't have those kind of things. Also, you've got to be sure that you're not choosing to do things, to consume things upon your own lusts and desires. You've got to crucify that flesh daily, remember. If you don't, you'll be in trouble. Because those lusts will take over and they'll start driving. It's why people get involved in compulsive spending. I want, I want, I want, I want. Compulsive spending, devils need to be cast out of you. You need to cast them out and get rid of them. Not let them get a hold of you. He says, you lust and have not. You kill and desire to have. James 4, 2 and 3. Cannot obtain. You fight in war. Yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not. And this is I talking about praying correctly. Iteo and Lombano. Why? Because you make a demand, I tell you, a miss, that you may consume it upon your own lusts. Otherwise, your motivation. You can be doing everything right according to the word, but if you've got the wrong motivation, nowhere. You can't be seeking to consume things on your own lusts. Remember the prodigal son? <laughs> he did a lot of riotous living and did evil stuff. But one of the things was, I mean, he was just run by his lusts. All he cared about was what he wanted to do. And we see in Luke 15, 14, when he spent all, there rose a mighty famine in the land and began to be in one. He spent it all. <coughs> he wasted it. He consumed it on all of his lusts. He squandered it all. He began to be in one. Use your money wisely. If you get inheritance money that comes in, don't just spend it on everything. Oh, now I got some money, I can go spend it. People sometimes can't, they can't even hold on to the money. They got to spend, spend, spend right away. That's a mistake. I know a pe pe person had a inheritance money and they were supposed to use it to, to buy. It was enough they'd be able to buy like a home uh, and, and almost, almost paid off and buy a condominium or buy a condominium and be paid off and so forth. And they squandered the whole thing. And now they have nothing. They blew it on all kinds of stuff. Out of I want, I want, I want, I want. Make wise decisions with what you do. We need to be wise in everything. We need to be a wise steward. The finances that you have, you need to be wise in what you do. 1 Corinthians 4.2 Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It's required in stewards. You are a steward. You're managing the finances that have come to you. You're a manager over all that you have. Are you managing it good? Do you know where all your finances come, go to? Are you going through, well, I don't have enough to pay my bills. I don't have to do this. Or the guy says, I don't have enough to tithe, you know. I remember the one woman that told me she, she couldn't tithe. And I said, uh, well, I'm, first of all, are you have a counting of all your money. Do you know where all your money goes to? As well, I kind of have a pretty good idea. So why don't we sit down and take a look at all where all your money's going to? I'll be glad to help you if you'd like. She says, oh, yeah, I'd like that. We sat down, went through. I said, well, the first thing we're going to do when we figure out the income, we take the tithe right off the top. I took that off the top, 10%. Gone. Paid to God. And then we started going through all the bills, the rent, you know, the utilities, you know, the car payment, all the different things, any credit card expense, whatever expense they might have had. Started listing them all out, going through all the payments, took them all that amount for groceries, you know, amount for gas for the car, car payment, all that kind of stuff. 
got down at the end, there's $150 left. So well, where is this all going? I don't know. <laughs> so well, what do you do? Well, I, I do buy stuff here and spend stuff here and you know, get all these things that in, in the machines at work, you know, and probably spends it on the stomach, you know, all the time. Or, or go, oh, I see something I like, I want to get that, you know. Overexpending, not watching their finances. Hey, we got to be wise. We got to manage our finances right. You are a steward, and it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That is what God expects of you and me. He wants us to be wise in what we do. Well, we've covered a lot of things tonight, and we've got a lot of things yet to cover. One thing for sure, God's will is for you to prosper, have a good journey, be blessed in everything that you do. You must put things right. It starts, of course, spiritually, being born again, putting the word first place, walking in his ways, soul realm prosperity. He wants you to be in health. He wants you to prosper in everything that you do. Poverty or lack is a curse. God does not bring those upon people. God wants to bring blessings upon you. The devil's the one who brings that because of disobedience, not tithing, not having a right attitude in the way you give of your offerings, not giving to the poor. Hide the eyes. I don't want to see anybody who has any poor. It's all for me. If you're a bunch of me, 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 you know, you've got a problem. If you cover over your sins, if you're not laying up treasure in the heavenly bank account, but instead you're just all out there for getting all the things that I can get for me. If you're not looking to God as your source, if you won't hear instruction, if you're disobedient to his word, if you're not seeking him, if you're not hearkening to the word, if you are greed and covetous, I almost want to get rich, you know. If you ever try to pay money to get a gift of God, it's not going to happen in your life, that's for sure. You have the love of money, it will be a root of all evils. Trusting in uncertain riches, serving riches, lazy, slothful, drunkard, glutton. And you haven't cast out the inherited generational spirits. You got all these different things. Following wrong people. Following pleasures. Allowing yourself to be accumulating in debt where you're paying so much out to the lender. <laughs> you know, you're pay, you might be paying out hundreds and hundreds of dollars to the lender on a monthly basis. When you could be, if you were being wise on the way we do it, you'd be saving that money. See, you want to do everything possible to get out of debt. Confidence in something else other than the Lord. The Lord needs to be your confidence. You can't have any fear. You can't be consuming upon your own lusts. You can't have that compulsive buying, impulsive buying attitude. Get rid of all the things that are, that are of any kind of greediness, any kind of focus on money, on things, trying to accumulate things. Again, God wants to bless you. Remember, he wants to give us all things richly to enjoy. And he will bless the work of your hands. Get your eyes on the Lord. Remember, you're doing everything that God wants you to do. He will bless you. He will pour out his blessings upon you that there won't be room enough to receive. Many people, because they have these curses, the devourer's not been rebuked. And the things they're sowing, they're getting destroyed. They're not seeing the fruit come to pass in their season. That's all the work of the enemy. You want everything that you do to be prosperous. God's promise is for that. If we will eliminate all these hindrances and walk in line with this word, we will see the prosperity of God in our life. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you. The will of God is for me to prosper. I thank you that I will prosper in everything that I do. I must eliminate all hindrances to prosperity. I will put the word first place. I will eliminate all these hindrances. I will make sure that my focus is upon the Lord. My confidence is in Him. I will never trust in uncertain riches. I am a tither. I give of offerings. I don't hide my eyes from the poor. I don't cover over my sins. I deal with them. I have a right attitude in everything that I give. I do it joyfully, never grudgingly, never of necessity. I am seeking God first place and hearkening to his voice. I will have no greed, no covetousness, no focus upon getting money and riches and serving them 
or consume, getting, uh, wanting the things. My life does not consist in the things that I possess. I thank you. I will not follow after wrong ways or wrong people or pleasures. And I will do everything that I can do to get out of debt so that I own everything that I have. And I will not be in bondage to a lender. I will be a wise steward over my finances. I thank you that I will receive your blessings. You'll give me all things richly to enjoy. I thank you that you are prospering the work of my hands in everything that I do. I am a wise steward, a wise manager over everything that I do. I will take a look at all my finances and know what I'm spending my money on and be sure I'm being wise in everything that I do. I thank you, Lord, that as I come in line with your word, you will prosper the work of my hands. You will bring your blessings upon me. There will be not even room enough to receive it. It will come upon me. I thank you for bringing forth your prosperity in every area of life. And I will have the testimony, as Abraham had, that God made me prosperous. God brought everything to me. God's the one who blessed me. I thank you, Lord, for bringing your prosperity in my life as I eliminate these hindrances and a mature of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you. Each one who hears this will eliminate these hindrances. Be a doer of the word. Put the word first place. Get our eyes on the Lord. Don't let anything out there in the world get us moving in other directions. We will be always doing what you want. And we thank you for your prosperity in each one's life as we are hearers and doers of this word in Jesus' name. Amen.